For years, no one in Seattle knew who killed this rock singer. The evidence sat waiting in a freezer until a computer identified a suspect 3,000 miles away. In the early 1990s, Seattle, Washington was home to a revolution in rock music. Some people called it grunge, others called it sub-pop. It was hard, it was edgy, and it drew thousands of people to the area. Musicians were moving here from all over the world to play, and there were fans moving here just to watch, just to see live music, because you could go to a small club and see pretty much what people thought would be the next big thing. Back in the early 1990s, there were a million emerging bands, and they all had the same kind of grunge sound. Ground Zero for this rock revolution was a part of downtown Seattle known as Capitol Hill. Rents were cheap, drugs were plentiful, and crime was rising. Early one morning, around 3.20 a.m., a pedestrian found a woman's body on a deserted city street and they tried to resuscitate her. She was still warm. It appeared that she had expired literally just a few minutes before. The victim was a young woman with no identification. She'd been strangled with a cord from a sweatshirt bearing the name of a local rock band, the Gits. The body's location made it look like there was a possible religious link to the crime. On either side of her, or either side of the street, are religious uh, buildings. One is a, a Catholic church, and the other is a Catholic services, a community area. She was laying on her back. Her feet were close together, and her hands were out to her side, sign kind of line of crucifix. At the victim's autopsy, something unexpected happened. The medical examiner recognized her. He liked to go to the clubs and listen to independent music. He knew who Mia Zapata was. 27-year-old Mia Zapata was the lead singer and songwriter of The Gets, one of the most popular bands to emerge from the Seattle music scene. Well, the local rock music community is saddened tonight by the death of a Seattle band's lead singer. The young woman was murdered, and police are searching for her killer. The motive is unknown. We had been on tour on the West Coast. We were to be home for three or four days before we were to leave on the road again. We had a, a U.S. tour, a European tour, and another U.S. tour planned consecutively. Investigators tried to reconstruct Mia's activities before her murder. According to friends, she spent most of the night at a local bar. Mia was at the Comet Tavern having some drinks with friends. I believe she was there till about midnight. From there, she visited the apartment of a friend who lived nearby. She left there on foot around 2 a.m. Mia really liked to walk and Seattle's a great area to walk around in, and so I think that's why she chose not to take a cab. Her body was discovered about an hour and a half later on a deserted stretch of road, less than half a mile from her friend's apartment. So we know that in that 80-minute gap, she had been um, accosted, attacked, kidnapped, brutalized. So her killer was um, quite busy in those uh, 80 minutes. We had a very clear and limited timeline here. I don't believe that Mia intentionally went in or voluntarily went into anybody's car. And the reason is that all of her friends were adamant on the fact that that's something that she simply would not do. Unfortunately, the killer left very little forensic evidence. I thought it could be some ex-boyfriend. It could be a random creep. It could be a woman. It could be a, a gang. It could be anybody. The death of up-and-coming rock star Mia Zapata was big news in Seattle, Washington. 
I think a lot of people are, are really deeply hurt by her loss, by losing her. And um, I just think everyone really wants to find out who did it. And even though that won't bring her back, at least that will give somebody a sense of justice. Friends put up posters all over town asking for information about the murder. Police were deluged with tips. And right now, police have absolutely no suspects. At this point, they say no. And in fact, they said drugs don't appear to be involved. She was not uh, into drugs or anything like that. It's still very much a mystery tonight. But I think at that time, since there were so few answers, a lot of people were just, you know, speculating. Who, who could have done this? Was it someone she knew? Was it a complete stranger? The case had serious problems. There were no witnesses. And since the body was dumped, there was no evidence at the scene. When you broke down all the forensic evidence, or more accurately, a lack of evidence, this became a frustrating crime. At Mia Zapata's autopsy, the medical examiner found she had been beaten, strangled, and sexually assaulted. The Emmy said that the blows to her abdomen and the kicking and the kneeing, she would have died eventually on a scene had he not strangled her. It was brutal. The medical examiner noticed a bite mark on Mia's breast. He swabbed the area and sent it to the forensic lab, hoping the killer left his saliva, a possible source of DNA. Uh, DNA is being sloughed off from the cells, um, from the, your cheeks inside your mouth, and also um, your gums. And within those cells is the nucleated cells that have the DNA present. To determine if the material on the bite mark was saliva, the swabs were tested for the presence of amylase. This is an enzyme in saliva that breaks down food. A solution extracted from the swab was placed in a perforated Petri dish containing a starch-based gel, essentially a food source. To simulate the conditions for digestion, the dish was placed in an incubator and set at body temperature for 24 hours. When the dish was removed, there were large white spots, proof there was saliva on Mia's body. A positive result is a colorless area, so an area that's not blue. And this is due to the fact that the amylase is binding and breaking up the starch molecules. At the time, the sample was too small for DNA testing, so it sat in a storage freezer. In their search for suspects, investigators began with Mia's ex-boyfriend, Robert. Apparently, they had broken up shortly before the murder. Some people have said that she was a, a little bit upset about a recent breakup with her boyfriend. There was some talk that she might try to find him that night. But Mia's boyfriend said if she stopped by his apartment, he knew nothing about it. He claimed he was out with his friends, an alibi that checked out. Robert, her boyfriend, cooperated fully. He um, always appeared when asked. He took a lie detector test. He had an airtight alibi. Uh, very, very good. Uh, no creases in it. So he was eliminated immediately. Investigators couldn't find anyone who had a motive to kill Mia Zapata. And her circle of friends and acquaintances was fairly broad. Mia had a far-ranging group of friends. A lot of these friends had criminal histories. A lot of these people had violence in their past. A lot of people were somewhat obsessed with Mia. The, these people aren't the group you're going to find at the PTA meetings or, or, or you know, at the uh, Rotary Club meetings. Unfortunately, none of this yielded any new suspects. And it got to the point where there was nobody left to look at. And at that point, that's when you get concerned. Frustrated because the case hadn't been solved, Steve Moriarty, the Gitz drummer and a friend of Mia's since college, joined with band members to take a more active role in the investigation. We decided to hire our own private investigator, and we, were, we didn't have money, but we were going to find the money, and we, we were going to make sure that this, this got solved immediately. Moriarty and the band hired Lee Heron. Her first step was to re-interview virtually everyone the police had talked to. There were no eyewitnesses, and believe me, I tried. I mean, I went out a couple of nights with another investigator and talked with every prostitute on the street to see if anybody knew anything. I talked with all the neighbors in the area. People saw a car drive away, but they didn't see anybody in it around, the, around that time. Eventually, 
Lee Heron came to the same conclusions as the police. I think that most people thought that this was going to be an unsolved case forever. And I know that I thought that the only way it's going to be solved is either someone talks or they get some DNA evidence. The case went cold again, this time for nine years, until this man won the Nobel Prize and changed forensic science forever. Just two months before her murder, Mia Zapata wrote a song about her own death at the hands of a stranger. We were in the studio and I was there when she was writing the lyrics and she said, I want to write a song about a serial killer. I'm like, Why do you want to do that? She goes, because it's happening so much. The song was entitled, Sign of the Crab. Anything to get me in and then get me killed. Go ahead and slice me up and spread me all across the town. Cause you know you're the one that won't be found. The words were eerily similar to how Mia was killed. And it just seemed that that summer there was a lot of horrible, horrible crimes happening. And it affected Mia and it affected her writing. And it ended up being prophetic in that it happened to her. For nine long years, Mia's murder went unsolved. Frustrations mounted. I never thought that it would go unsolved for so long. And so as the days and the months and the years went by, I knew that lots of other people were losing faith that it would get solved. Mia's murder happened in 1993, and something else happened that year, too. Kerry Mullis won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for inventing a technique known as polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. This made it possible to perform DNA testing on very small samples. Well, with PCR, what you have is this chemical photocopier. So we were able to amplify that small piece of DNA up into large enough pieces that we can actually detect. The potential genetic sample in the Zapata case was so small that analysts, fearing the sample could still be destroyed, waited until the PCR process was so refined that microscopic amounts could be used for testing. In 2001, the swab from Mia's autopsy, the swab that might contain the killer's DNA, was finally tested with PCR technology. The process amplified or increased the sample size, making it large enough for testing. And it worked. What I did develop was a mixed profile that contained Mia Zapata's DNA along with at the time, an unknown male profile. The male DNA profile was isolated, then entered into CODIS, the nationwide computerized database that is designed to store the DNA profiles of everyone in the United States who has committed a felony. Unfortunately, there was no match. So the good news is there's the genetic profile. You're on pins and needles, who does it match? No one. Was it possible the killer had never committed another crime? Was he dead? Had he left the country? It was amazing to me that there was so little evidence. I mean, clearly, there, there was just nothing there except for one, one piece of saliva that was found on Mia's breast, and that was it. The case went cold again, and this time there was little hope that it would ever be solved. But the CODIS computer program kept running night and day. And 12 months later, the CODIS system reported a match. The DNA was from Jesus Mesquia, a Cuban exile living in Florida. And he was no stranger to violent crime. Who is this man? We found out that he's in the United States courtesy of uh, Fidel Castro from the uh, Marlito uh, boat lift. We know that he was kicked out of Cuba because he was a felon. We had uh, criminal history in uh, Florida and Arizona, nothing in Washington. And that bothered us because we figured, well, if he was here, why wasn't he messing up here? 
Seattle investigators decided to question Mesquia, who was out of jail and on probation. His last known address was in Marathon, Florida. Police there told their counterparts in Seattle they wouldn't let Mesquia out of their sight. U.S. Marshals from Seattle contacted people in Florida. Can you check this guy out? They said, well, bird dog him. But when Seattle investigators got to Florida, Jesus Mesquia was gone. We get the marathon, and uh, there ain't no way. <laughs> Jesus isn't around. You gotta be kidding me. For 10 years, Mia Zapata's murder went unsolved until a DNA database identified 48-year-old Jesus Mezquia as the perpetrator. When Seattle police went to Florida to question him, he was gone. When we do get to his home in Marathon, he's not there. He's inexplicably gone. Your paranoia once again takes over, and you think, oh, he's on to us. He's going to escape. But a few days later, Mesquia returned home. He said he had been working a temporary job on a fishing boat in Miami. Seattle investigators asked him if he was willing to answer a few questions, and he complied. He had no idea they were setting a trap. So he's being cooperative, and we put five pictures of people that we'd worked on, on murders, and we had Mia's upon his picture there. Now, you've seen Mia's picture. Mia's not your average librarian. She stands up. Mesquia said he didn't recognize any of the women in the photo lineup. We said, what if I told you you've killed one of these ladies? He says, no, no kill. And he jumps up. He puts his hands out there, look, no shake. Oh, I said, OK, you're a human polygraph. Sit down now. If Mezquia said he knew Mia Zapata or spent time with her, then there might be a plausible explanation for why his saliva was on her body. But when he said no, he sealed his fate. He denied ever knowing her, ever seeing her, ever anything to do with her. And his saliva is on her breast. I think the man's got a problem. A fresh sample of Mesquia's DNA was compared to the sample from Mia Zapata's autopsy. Again, there was a match. And that was the smoking gun that we were able to solve this case with, was that saliva. Had he not done this, we'd have nothing. A decade after Mia Zapata's death, the killer was finally charged. It really hasn't sunk in yet, so I'm still in a sort of state of shock about it. I just hope that, that, that this is real. Investigators learned that Jesus Mesquia once lived in Seattle, just three blocks from where he left Mia's body. When Mesquia was arrested for Mia's murder, one Seattle resident called police to say she recognized his picture in the newspaper as a man who had once exposed himself to her. I mean, the defense was screwed at that point. We've now got somebody who can testify, a live person who can testify to what a sick puppy he is. Prosecutors believe Jesus Mesquia was out cruising the streets of Seattle when he saw Mia Zapata walking home shortly after 2 a.m. According to friends, Mia had been drinking. Since she was wearing a Walkman headset listening to music, she most likely never heard Mesquia's car approach. Prosecutors think he abducted her, then took her to a deserted location. The DNA evidence proved he left his saliva on her body, then strangled her to death. He dumped her body on a deserted street just blocks from where he lived. Investigators don't think the location had any real significance. And he just opened a car door, grabbed her hands, drug her out, laid her there. That's how she landed, just happened chance. In 2004, 11 years after Mia Zapata's murder, Jesus Mezquia was tried and convicted of her murder. He was sentenced to 36 years in prison. There was justice, thanks to an alert medical examiner who preserved forensic samples even though they couldn't be tested at the time. 
Thank God that the medical examiner saved the one piece of DNA evidence that existed in this case. It took more than a decade, but that tiny piece of evidence and DNA technology finally caught up to a killer. This case did come down to a single swab, and that forward thinking by the medical examiner uh, uh, paid off um, more than we could ever have imagined. I'm fascinated by DNA science now, and, and it's also fascinating and amazing that, the, that this uh, um, medical examiner had the foresight to collect DNA on, on a sample that wouldn't be viable for another 10 years. Those swabs, I mean, were better than a smoking gun. You know, I mean, I don't care. I'll take, I'll take DNA over a smoking gun and eyewitness any time. And uh, it was the whole case. It was the entire case as far as being solved was that swap.